Okay, part two of chapter one. So now we are um, actually getting into the meat of the scientific method. And so um, if you've looked at the to-do list um, for week one or week two, you've seen this graphic before. I, um, a friend of mine, it, seemed, it feels weird to say friend because he was my professor <laughs> um, when I was in graduate school, um, but we're now Facebook friends. And he posted this on um, Facebook because that's what us old farts use um, is Facebook. And, um, you know, around the time when I first started having my kids um, and I thought it was adorable and also really perfect. So a few things to know about the scientific method is um, it's already something that we all use all the time um, informally and not not necessarily carefully or accurately all the time, but it is kind of a process that we use. So what we're gonna focus on is like how, how to do the scientific method in a sort of rigorous um, controlled way, okay? Um, fundamentally, I always ask in class, I always ask this in class when, you know, when we're all together, is I ask, um, how many of you did a science fair project when you were in, you know, elementary school or junior high? And everybody who was educated in a public school in California raises their hands. And um, so I know that the vast majority of you have learned the scientific method in some capacity or another. Um, and so um, this isn't really new, but it's, worth talking about, um, you know, the details, right? And, you know, kind of real scientific method rather than what you learn in elementary school. Okay, so anyway, sorry, that was a very long-winded intro for this. Um, so your book does a fabulous job of covering this um, material. And so they focus on an example where they're, you know, concerned with something that is vitally important, which is, um, the height of uh, cookies. <laughs> um, apparently, tall cookies are a goal in um, in your your textbook author in in his mind. Tall cookies are good cookies, um, which I find kind of funny because I'm like flatter and squishier is better, but whatever. Um, so they kind of your book kind of lays out the steps and you know goes through this process focusing on cookies and so i don't want to use that same example because um you can get that example from reading your book um but right we're gonna kind of refer to the same kind of steps um another thing i want you to know is that the scientific method depending on like what textbook you're reading the number of steps varies. So sometimes we treat like an observation and a question as like separate entities, because they technically they are, right? An observation is just like, oh, I've noticed something and then you start to have questions about it, right? And so the question in the scientific, in the scientific method is usually much more focused than just, I wonder what makes cookies better, right? Like that, you know, just kind of observational thing. Um, so, Sometimes it's treated as one step, sometimes it's treated as two. The hypothesis is another step that, you know, once again, if we were all in class together, I would say, okay, who's got a definition for a hypothesis? Throw it out there. So I want you to, you know, you're sitting here looking at your computer. I want you to stop for a second. And I want you to tell me, even though I can't hear you, <laughs> I want you to tell me your definition of hypothesis. Yeah, that's right. You always learn educated guess is what, you know, most people learn. Um, but that is uh, silly <laughs> for a variety of reasons, mostly because it's a, it's essentially an oxymoron, right? So when you say the word guess, you mean like, you're saying like, I don't know, I'm just throwing something out there. And, but educated implies like that you've done some sort of research or analysis, which you haven't done yet. So it just doesn't make any sense. So what I prefer is the definition that they give you here. So a hypothesis is a proposed explanation 
right? And it can be investigated. So your hypothesis is kind of like your jumping off point of how you're going to, you know, decide A, what your experiment looks like and B, what your experiment is testing. Okay, so you go from your hypothesis, a proposed explanation that can be investigated, um, and you move into an experiment. And so we're going to go through the steps of how to set up a good experiment, how to, you know, do, you know, what, what constitutes a good experiment. Um, and so by now you've done um, the experimental design um, simulation on Labster, or you haven't, depending on circumstances. Um, but we're going to kind of add some detail to that idea. Okay. And then um, once the experiment is completed, you put together some results. Um, often, this is another area where, you know, sometimes there's additional steps. So sometimes people put in, after the hypothesis, you put in a, a prediction like a two separate step thing, which I don't really like predictions. I just like hypotheses, so I'm okay with them sort of leaving that out here. Um, and then after your experiment, you have results. Those results usually undergo some sort of analysis. So they're not calling it analysis in your book, but analysis, okay? There's usually some sort of analysis, you know, kind of as a part of that process, um, or maybe it's a part of this process. I don't know. It kind of depends on, um, like I said, it depends on your book for where they kind of put that step. Um, and then you go to a conclusion. Well, one of the unfortunate things about um, the way that we're all taught the scientific method in like elementary school is we behave as though conclusion, Conclusion means the end, right? We're done, we're moving on to something else. Um, but often there really isn't a like, okay, we're done, we know everything we need to know about that, right? Often conclusions lead to um, further investigation of something else, okay? Um, and so that's why your book represents the scientific method as a, as a cycle, because it really is a cyclical process, okay? Um, so um, the, the three kind of, areas of the of the process are exploration where you're just being curious essentially testing where you're more focused right and then the outcomes are what you're sharing okay or what the like what was the purpose of doing that what is what is the outcome that we have okay so this is not something this is this is not something as important as this okay all right, so like I said, um, I thought we could kind of go through these steps with a different example, aside from the one that's in your book, just to, you know, because that one's a good one, but this one might be different. And this one also lends us to talking about some other things that cookies don't allow us to talk about, okay? So these are images from a, from a different textbook, um, but I really like their, um, I don't like their steps, but I like their example. Okay, so, um, first step is observation, right? So um, some people think that um, echinacea appears to reduce intensity of dura or duration of common cold. So echinacea is a um, herbal supplement that is um, from a uh, plant, right? You can see a picture of it in the, in the bottle here. <laughs> Looks like that. It's called a cone flower, okay? So basically it's ground up plant parts. Okay. Um, and some people swear by this. Okay. And they, 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 you know, I've observed that my cold is shorter when I take echinacea. Okay. So once again, remember observations aren't, at least this type of observations aren't rigorous. They're not carefully controlled. They're just, eh, seems like maybe this is happening. Okay. So you develop a hypothesis. Now, um, one of the things your book talks about is it talks about, um, talks about positive and negative hypothesis, but one of the things that I want us to talk about is a null hypothesis, null, N-U-L-L, -L, versus alternate. Okay, so the example that they're showing you here, right, they're showing you, sorry, I've got this like stupid video bar in my way. Um, so step two, formulating a hypothesis. Okay, so the hypothesis that they've listed here is echinacea reduces the duration and severity of the common cold. Okay, that 
is an example of an alternate hypothesis, okay? A null hypothesis is essentially that there is no relationship. Usually when people use the term hypothesis, they mean this, okay? So, you make an observation that it appears as though echinacea helps reduce duration severity of the common cold, okay? Um, so, or some people say that, or, you know, that's a claim that's on a package. And so the hypothesis is that, oh, in fact, that is true, right? The, the hypothesis is that echinacea reduces duration and severity of the common cold, okay? That's what we call the alternate hypothesis. That often is just referred to as the hypothesis, okay? Um, the null hypothesis is typically the opposite of that or a statement of no relationship. So what would the null hypothesis be that goes with this hypothesis? I'll let you think about that for a second. I'm gonna have a sip of coffee. Yes. Yes, good job. Uh, so the null hypothesis would be echinacea has no effect on duration and severity of the common cold. Okay, so a statement of no relationship, all right? Sometimes it's really important to be really clear about what those are, okay? Another thing that's really important to realize, and this is one of the areas where people um, sort of misunderstand what science is, okay? The process of science is all about disproving our hypotheses. What? But aren't we trying to show that echinacea does in fact reduce duration and severity of common cold? That's not actually the goal. And the reason that that's not the goal is because the only way that you actually make progress in science is to find out what is not true. And along the way, you might gather additional evidence of what may be true. But one of the terms that we have to be very careful with in science is prove or um, proof or whatever. Okay, so as you're doing your labs this week, some of you are going to be tempted to say in your, in your conclusion statement in your lab, you're going to be tempted to say, this experiment proved that XYZ, or I have, I have proven that XYZ. And in reality, that's not really true. You did one experiment at one time in one place, and okay, maybe it turned out to support your hypothesis, okay? That's, that's the terminology that we like to use. The results of this experiment support the hypothesis, okay? Um, but you're not proving anything, okay? Because proof has a higher threshold of evidence than any of us could ever achieve in one experiment in your kitchen, okay? All right, we'll kind of, we'll come back to that in a second, okay? So, the alternate hypothesis is what most people refer to as a hypothesis. And so this is our, remember, it's not an educated guess. We don't like that. It's a proposed explanation or a proposed outcome, basically. Okay? All right. So in your book, they're, they're talking about flour and cookies. Um, another piece of information that kind of relates to the idea of a hypothesis is thinking about what types of variables there are. So the term variable is exactly what it sounds like. It's all the different things that may vary in how you do something, right? So what are all the different variables that affect your common cold, right? So it might be supplement usage, but it also might be age or health or, you know, like overall health or underlying health conditions or, um, stress levels or, right, there, you know, or diets, right? What kinds of things you're eating, right? Sorry, I'm like stifling a yawn. I'm okay. Um, so 
um, there are lots of variables that come into play when you are deciding what your hypothesis is, okay? So the variable that we're testing in this example is use of echinacea, okay? The other variables then, we want to, as much as possible, we want to leave those alone, okay? All right, so in your cookie example, they're talking about independent and dependent variables. This is kind of confusing terminology, but I really like the way they explain it in your book. This is gonna come into play more when we talk about graphing. So for right now, um, this terminology isn't particularly useful, but it will be useful in a, in a few minutes, okay? So how do you know which variable is the dependent variable, which variable is the independent variable? Um, when you th it's kind of tricky to explain actually right even though it's a simple concept it's hard to communicate it um so the way that i always like to think about it is the dependent variable is the one that you expect to respond to some change in the independent variable so the dependent variable depends upon the independent variable okay and so the example that i often like to give for this is let's say that you um were uh brand new to the planet <laughs> right or oh even better let's say that you um move you you are from somewhere else in the world and you move to california and you for whatever reason you don't have access to records or anything um and you know whatever okay and you're like so your question might be, so what time of year do we get the most rain? Okay. Um, and, you know, maybe you've been living in California for, you know, a couple months. And so you have an idea of like, you know, oh, it appears that we get more rain in the, you know, fall than any other time of year. Right. And so you go about testing your hypothesis by, by beginning to take good records, right? So you keep track of, you know, how much rain um, falls during different times of year, okay? So in that scenario, let's talk about what the variables are. So the dependent variable, right? What would the dependent variable be in that situation? You're looking at, how much rain falls in different times of year, in different months, let's say. Okay, so it would help, I think it would help if I draw a little graph. Okay, all right, so rain. We usually measure rain in um, height, which is weird, right? So we don't ever, we don't talk about this very often, but like in weather reports, they'll be like, we're going to get a quarter of an inch of rain today. What does that mean? It means that, you know, if you collected it and measured the height of it, it would, whatever. Okay. We're going to get a quarter of an inch of rain. Well, in science, we always use the metric system. So I'm not going to write inch. I'm going to write centimeters. Okay. Um, and then the other thing that we're keeping track of is the time, right? So month. So we're keeping track of time and the unit is month months okay so notice we have two variables each one is labeled and each one has units okay now sometimes people get kind of lazy with this because if you write the month names right along the bottom here it, it's going to be obvious to anybody who's looking at your graph what you're talking about um so sometimes people get sort of lazy about labeling i want you to try to have good habits with labeling so there will be graphing that's happening in lab right nothing super sophisticated all of it can be hand drawn okay so don't feel like oh my god i have to learn how to graph things in excel you don't unless you want to okay but you don't um so we label Okay, now the question is, it's like, how did she, now she's talking about graphs, what's happening? Um, which, in my example, which variable is the dependent variable and which variable is the independent variable, okay? So here's how we're gonna find that out. I'm gonna ask you the question, does the amount of rain depend on which month it is 
or does the month depend on how much rain we get? Okay, so let me explain what I mean. Okay, so I'm gonna put in some fake data. So January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November. <laughs> I almost forgot November. <laughs> okay, so there's our months. All right, and then I don't know how much rain we get. I'm just gonna make up some crap. So January, usually get a good amount of rain. February, still usually a good amount of rain. March, maybe it kind of, May, oh, by the time we're here, it's like every so often we get a like winter or a summer like boop, like <laughs> little boop, <laughs> a little bit of rain. And then when does it start raining? I always say, I said to somebody the other day, usually not until after Halloween. So then we start getting rain. And then, yeah. Okay. So let's go back to the question that I asked a second ago. Which of these things is dependent on the other, rain or time? So let's say next year, for whatever reason, right? I don't know. There's some sort of weird atmospheric phenomenon, right? The world is ending. I don't know. Okay. Let's say that we get this much rain in August. Okay. Do we still call that time period August or do we change the name of that time period to March? Because normally that's the amount of rain we get in March. The answer is no, we don't because time is a constant. Time is a independent variable. Right? So the independent variable is the thing that you're changing or the thing that you're looking at, right? To see what effect it has on the dependent variable. So in this case, we want to know what effect does, you know, month of the year have on average rainfall? Okay, so then our rain is the, and by the way, there will be some sort of number scale on here. I don't, I don't know. Okay, since it's made up, I don't know. <laughs> okay, so the amount of rainfall is our dependent variable. Okay, so with that cookie example, right? The dependent variable is the thing that you're measuring, the thing that you're trying to change, the thing that you're hoping to see some manipulation, right? So what's the dependent variable here in our cookie example? Well, it's the height of the cookie, right? And you want to know how, that, how the height of the cookie is affected by which type of flour you use. Are you using cake flour, all-purpose flour, bread flour? Yeah, okay, so flower type is the independent variable. The height of the cookie is dependent, okay? In my weather example, time is the independent variable and um, amount of rain is the dependent variable. So the amount of rain is determined by, is dependent upon what month it is rather than the other way around. So one thing that you'll notice with this graph is that almost always the dependent variable is the vertical axis or the y axis, they sometimes call it for, for those of you that are in math, right? And the um, x axis, the horizontal axis, is generally the independent variable, okay? One other thing that you always want to include in a good graph is a title, all right? Because some people need to know what is the graph, what is the graph about? What is it telling me? Okay, so what would we call this one? Uh, rainfall, average rainfall in Southern California. Something that tells you what the graph is trying to show you. Okay, so that's independent, dependent variable. Okay, so this book, other book that we don't use, includes as a step in the scientific method, they include a prediction statement. Um, a prediction is not the same thing as a hypothesis, right? A hypothesis is just, just a, um, you know, echinacea reduces the severity and da, 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 da. 
of the common cold, right? Duration and severity of the common cold. A prediction is always an if then statement. I don't want to belabor this point because I don't care if you do this, but if you're having a hard time figuring out how you want to design your experiment, sometimes it's useful to have a prediction statement. It is not in place of your hypothesis. You always need to have a hypothesis, but you might also think, okay, well, if my hypothesis is true, then I expect X, Y, Z. Okay. That's what this step is. So if echinacea reduces the duration and severity of symptoms of a common cold, then individuals taking echinacea should get sick less frequently and individuals who get sick should recover more quickly. Okay, all right. Next step is our experiment. I'm gonna make that go away for a second. Okay, so another really, really important aspect of the scientific method to appreciate is something called a control. So you always have a control group And you always have an experimental group. Or sometimes multiple control groups and um, multiple experimental groups. Okay. Now, your book, like I mentioned earlier, and I think I said it backwards, your book talks about positive and negative controls. Um, I'm not so worried about that right now. Um, I just want you to know what a control group is in general. Okay, so a control group is a basis of comparison. That's why we use a control group. Okay, the experimental group is the group that receives the treatment in this case or where you're manipulating a variable okay so um yeah okay so um so in our echinacea example what would the control group be what are we, so if our, so let me back up a step. So our experimental group is where we're manipulating a variable. So in this particular case, our experimental group would be individuals who are treated with echinacea, okay? Because that's the experiment, that's what we're testing, okay? So we're manipulating our variable, okay? What would the control group be? So the control group would be individuals who are not treated with echinacea. Okay. Why do we have a control group? Why are control groups so important? Okay, so let me ask this way. Let's say that you had 50 people and it was cold season and you gave everybody echinacea. And, you know, some people were sick for, some people didn't get sick at all. Some people were sick for a short people of time. Some people were sick for a long period of time, but they all had echinacea. Would that tell you anything about the efficacy of the echinacea? Did it work or not? Not really, because you don't have anything to compare it to, right? So maybe that group did in fact have fewer symptoms or shorter colds than they would have if they weren't taking the echinacea. But if you don't have a control group, you have no way of knowing that because you have nothing to compare them to, right? Okay, so control groups are really important because this is what we're comparing our experimental group to. If you don't have a good control group, your experimental group is meaningless. Okay, absolutely meaningless. Okay, so now we're starting to get complicated because now they're like, wait a minute, we've got four groups and it's crazy and blah, 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 blah. Okay, so we already talked about controls versus experimental groups. Another thing we need to talk about is we need to talk about sample size and replication. It's kind of, I'm going to put it in parentheses, it's kind of a related topic, but not exactly the same thing. 
okay? Um, another thing we need to talk about, I'm gonna write it over here, are um, number of variables. Okay, so first of all, notice in this example, they took a large number of volunteers, okay? Why not just use four people? Why use 437 volunteers? Why not just use four people, okay? So this was an actual study that was done. It's, it was a pretty small study, but it was a study that was done and um, uh, with college students, okay? So they, um, college students, as I'm sure you guys realize, and if you haven't realized it yet, you will if you transfer, undergraduate, for that matter, even graduate students, any college student will do just about anything for a free meal, <laughs> okay? So if you want people to come to your meeting or your presentation or whatever, all you gotta do is be like, pizza, there's gonna be pizza. And the college students are like, yes, please. And they come, <laughs> okay? So it's really easy to get people to, for volunteer, to volunteer to do stuff um, when they're college students, right? Give them a little money, give them a gift card to the bookstore give them some pizza and they're like, sweet, sure, whatever, <laughs> I'll do it, okay? Um, so we got some volunteers here, okay? So why not just use four volunteers? That would be easier, then we just have to keep track of four people. So why would we use 437 um, instead of just four? So there's actually like a whole constellation of reasons as to why that's um, why you would use a big group. Okay. One is um, that you larger numbers means more statistically significant results. Okay, so one thing to kind of keep in mind, sorry, I got to pause for a second. Sorry, I had to plug in my computer, <laughs> my battery was dying. Okay, so um, by increasing your sample size, the number of individuals you test or the number of times you do a test, um, the more significant or accurate your results are going to be. So let's say we only did four people instead of 437. Well, what if one of the people didn't really quite follow through with the experiment? Or what if one of them, their, their body, for whatever reason, their body, just the way they metabolize echinacea is different than is typical. So, you know, their body responds to it differently than otherwise. Or what if one of those four people was somebody who just like, for whatever reason, had like a killer immune system and like they never got sick. Or what if one of the people in that group was um, somebody who was immune compromised or somebody who was a germaphobe and like, in addition to taking the echinacea, was like slathering the hand sanitizer all over themselves all the time, right? In, in ways that aren't, you know, typical of the other members of the group. So, okay. So the reason that we want to have a big sample is to try to dilute any of that experimental noise. Okay. So typically when you do an experiment, especially if it's something with humans, you want to get a big group of humans and you want to make sure that your experimental group and your um, control group, while every human is different, that's one of the tricky things about doing studies with any kind of living organism, right? Is everybody's different, right? Everybody's going to respond to medications differently, right? But the goal is you get a big group and then you make sure that those groups have similar demographics. So similar number of males and females in each group, a similar number of individuals of different genetic or um, ethnic backgrounds, um, similar age ranges within the groups, right? Um, and so in this particular example, it's like, well, you know, maybe this doesn't apply to, you know, older folks, elderly adults, because the um, study subjects were all college students, but at least within those groups, you didn't have one group that had, you know, octogenarians in it. And then the other group was all 20 somethings because those two groups aren't going to respond to the common cold the same way. 
right? So anyway, okay, so not only do you wanna have large samples, so as many samples as is reasonable, but you also want to have groups that are similar, okay? And when possible, so, right, high number of individuals, right, lots of samples. Um, the other thing you wanna do is you want to have similar groups. And then the other thing you wanna do is you want to try to reduce the number of variables. that are being manipulated. Okay, so if you're doing this study about echinacea, right, and you wanna know how echinacea affects, um, you know, common cold, you might have a rule as part of the study that um, everyone who is in the study um, has to, um, promise not to use hand sanitizer for a week, okay? Or everybody in the group has to um, not use some other purported treatment. So nobody's allowed to do the like super high vitamin C dosage, right? If you want to take your multivitamin, fine, but you can't take like these super mega doses of vitamin C, for example, right? you want to pick people that have similar amounts of sleep each night. So maybe you do a survey when you're making your groups, right? And you try to try to spread their own. Okay. So the reason you want to reduce the number of different variables is because if there is more than one variable that's different between the groups, then, and you get a result of some kind, if there's multiple variables that are different, you don't know which variable was responsible for the difference. Okay, so for example, let's say that we have a control group, we have an experimental group, and, you know, our control group um, are, you know, don't get enough sleep, drink too much, right, I don't know, right, they eat junky food, they're under a lot of stress, and our echinacea group is people who are, like, more health conscious, more you know, careful about getting enough sleep and getting exercise and all of that. And then you see a difference, right? You see that, oh, the group that took echinacea, actually less, fewer of them got a cold, fewer of them, you know, if they did get a cold, it went faster, right? But the problem is, you don't know if that was due to the echinacea or if that difference was actually due to the fact that they had different lifestyles. They got more sleep. They exercised more. They ate healthier food. You know, you don't know what was responsible for the difference that you saw, okay? And so a better way of doing it would be if you have a group of college students, <laughs> right? And you don't, you know, and they all have different kind of behaviors. Maybe you do a survey and, for the, and, and make sure that each group, the experimental and the control, each group has people with both types of lifestyles. So each group has, you know, the people who aren't super health conscious and the people who are health conscious, right? So you kind of make it so that the, the you know, what do I want to say? You want to make it so that the um, composition of the groups is the same, okay? That's what I mean by similar groups. All right. With people, it's complicated to do this. When you're doing your lab this week, it's not going to be difficult to do that because you're going to be doing an experiment that you have a lot of control over, right? So you can control how much water you use. You can control the temperature of the water. You can control, you know, all of these different things so that you can be sure that you're only manipulating one variable rather than more than one, okay? So we want to reduce the number of variables being manipulated. Ideally, only one. Okay, not always possible with humans. Totally possible for the experiment you guys are gonna be doing. Okay, now, sorry, water. So hot and miserable at my house, miserable. Okay, so this whole thing is really looking complicated here. <laughs> right? Because now we have four groups, but wait a minute, you just said we had to have a control group and an experimental group. Why do we have four groups? Um, in this particular case, really, 
they're asking two different questions. One of them is um, intensity. The other question is duration. So, all right, duration, severity. So that's really two different questions, okay? So less frequently, so less likely to get sick. Individuals who do get sick would recover, okay? So because of that, the design of this experiment actually has four groups. It has, um, because it's asking two different questions. Okay, so with our um, volunteers, right? <laughs> Set them into four groups. We try to make those groups the same as possible. Two of the groups get no treatment on the first pass. The other two groups, one of them gets a, an echinacea tablet every day before being exposed to the common cold, okay? The other group gets a placebo. Let's talk about a placebo for a second. So a placebo is a fake thing. So um, people talk about placebos being a sugar pill, right? So here you take a tablet and you take a tablet, right? So one of you is getting a tablet that has echinacea in it. The other one is getting a tablet that doesn't have echinacea in it. And usually it has some sort of inert substance like sugar, okay? Um, there are all different kinds of placebos that are utilized. So sugar pill is just one example of a placebo. You can have placebo injections. So let's say that a medication that we're testing instead of, you know, being a pill that you take, it's an injection. Well, a placebo injection is just salt water, right? So it's inert. It doesn't have anything in it that will affect your health one way or the other, right? It has the same amount of salt that's in your blood. So, you know, just plain old salt water. And that's the, um, that's the placebo for that. Whereas the other injection has, you know, whatever the, the drug you're testing in it. Okay. Um, why are placebos important? What role does a placebo have? Well, placebos are important in which group, your control group or your experimental group? So when you're doing human studies, placebos are a part of your experimental group, right? I said that backwards. <laughs> hmm. Placebos are part of your control group, right? Your basis of comparison. So it's your group that is not receiving the echinacea, right? It's the ones that are, you know, just nor normal, okay? Um, why give a placebo? Why not just say okay, you guys are the control group, so we're not giving you any echinacea. Why do we have a placebo at all? All right, well, this goes back to something that we talked about before. So this is true of humans for sure when we're doing human studies, but even some studies with animals. Um, it's important to have placebos because remember that our psychology is really strong in how we perceive the world and how we behave okay so if somebody is in the control group and they get a placebo they're going to be like all right well that means i'm fated to get sick and the people that are in the echinacea group are going to be like, sweet, I'm not going to get sick, right? And just knowing that piece of information and having that attitude of like knowing what group you're in um, can actually totally skew the results by a small amount, but can skew the results, okay? And so this is something that is called the placebo effect. Okay, so the placebo effect is really, really interesting. In any kind of um, drug trial or even like surgeries, they do fake surgeries with placebos. So let's say they're testing some sort of new like 
um, knee surgery, knee implant surgery, right? Where they're like, you know, reconstructing people's knees and they want to know if it improves, you know, knee function. If they're in the stages where they're doing early testing, they might do a sham surgery. And what that means is that they, you know, knock you out, <laughs> they cut your knee open, but then they don't do anything and they just close it back up again. <laughs> right? Now, you might be thinking, how is that ethical? Right. Well, they would always tell you if you participate in research as a as a patient, right, as a volunteer, they will always tell you it's possible that you're in the control group and you're not actually getting any treatment. Right. So you know that that's a possibility. OK. Um, so the placebo effect is really, really important because the placebo effect um, means that sometimes people feel better purely because they think they're going to feel better, right? So this is especially useful in like pain management, for example. If you tell somebody, I'm gonna give you this pill and it's gonna make your headache go away, to a certain extent, it doesn't matter what's in the pill because there's this aspect of mind over matter, right? If it's a minor headache, and you tell somebody here, oh, here, sweetie, I'm going to give you something that's going to make you feel better, right? Then it might just be that their brain is like, oh, okay, okay, we're going to feel better. So they start, you know, your brain starts making more endorphins. And so you actually do feel better, even though there was no medication in the pill. Okay. Um, so placebos, the reason we want a test that has a placebo is so that you can make sure that the group that's getting echinacea actually is better above and beyond what the placebo effect is, okay? So the placebo effect should be a small effect compared to if there's a real difference with the treatment group, right? Then they'll have a bigger effect than the placebo effect. And that tells you that, it's, that there's a real thing happening, okay? Now the other two groups, don't get any treatment in the beginning, right? So we're, we're essentially, you know, with these first two groups, the question we're asking is, if you take echinacea, does it prevent you from getting sick? The other two groups, it's like, we're not looking for prevention. We just want to know if you're exposed, does it make your cold less severe or shorter? Okay. So then they expose everybody, all four groups to the common cold, right? So they, they make you, I don't know, touch a doorknob <laughs> with some virus on it or something. I don't know. They give everybody a nasal swab. I don't know. But they expose you to a common cold virus, okay? Um, then everybody continues, you know, either continues their treatment if it's in the first two groups or the other two groups start a treatment. And so once again, for each of those groups, we have a um, control and an experimental group, right? So we have our placebos here and here, yeah, where they're taking a pill, they don't know whether or not it's got echinacea in it. And then we have our two groups that are getting echinacea and they don't know whether or not they're getting echinacea either. This phenomenon we call having a double blind study. Okay, so let's look at that. Oh, here we go. Sorry, my PowerPoint is hanging up. We'll come back and talk about this in a second, right? So there's three different types of study. There's studies that are not blind, meaning do the test subjects know which group is which? Do the researchers know which group is which? Um, then there's also single blind studies and there's also double blind studies. So single and double refer to um, is it just one or two groups that don't know what's happening? So a single blind study would be a study where the test subjects don't know which group they're in. So they don't know if they're um, in the experimental group or the control group, but the researchers do know, right? So if you're going to do a sham surgery, you can't do a sham surgery as a double blind because the surgeon is going to know, did I put the, you know, fancy new knee implant in their knee or not? <laughs> right? You're, you know, that can't be double blind. It has to be single blind. Okay. But lots of studies, particularly with medications are double blind, meaning that the researcher sets up the experiment, right? And they say, okay, there's going to be X number of groups. 
they're going to be getting pills. But what they do is they record numbers, let's say, right? And so each individual that's in the study gets a bottle with a number, right? But nobody knows except for that computer, except for that, you know, database file somewhere, whether or not bottle 32 contains echinacea or contains um, just a control, a sugar pill, a placebo, right? Now, a computer knows that. The person who dispenses the medication may or may not, right? But if you've just randomly put people in these individual, I shouldn't say randomly, you've put these people in these individual groups and then they've been assigned a pill bottle, but neither the person who's taking the pills or the researcher who is administering it and then testing them and asking them about their symptoms knows which group they're in. That's even better because sometimes researchers are biased, okay? So let's go back to the idea of a fake knee surgery, right? So let's say that, you know, somebody goes through this process and they're in the study of having this, you know, testing out this new knee surgery, okay? And the researcher knows who, you know, who got which surgery. And so when somebody who got the new knee implant comes in, the doctor's like, so how are you feeling? Are you feeling better? How's your knee? Do you feel like you have better range of motion? Right? Um, whereas when somebody who has a sham surgery, it's like, yeah, so how's, how's your knee? Yeah, what do you think? Do you have better range of motion? Um, right? That could impact the results because um the attitudes of people right even if you try really hard to be neutral are never neutral right um and so whenever we're talking about studies involving human subjects double blind is sort of like the gold standard that's what we always shoot for it's not always possible right you can't do a sham surgery that's double blind okay at least not the kind that i'm describing yeah, but um, double blind is always the way to go because then you don't know, if you don't know what group you're in, right, then you don't know um, what to, you, you don't have bias, right, about what you think is going to happen. That said, I will say that even within a double blind study, often people who are in a study, particularly if it's long term, um, can have strong suspicions one way or another about which group they're in. So my dad once participated in a study where um, he's got, you know, he's got high cholesterol and, you know, old man stuff. Um, <laughs> and he was um, in a study where they were testing the efficacy of high doses of niacin, which is a vitamin, right, that is in most of our diets. Um, really high doses of niacin and how that affects your cholesterol and, um, you know, all that, you know, all that kind of, all kinds of different markers about um, heart health. So cholesterol, um, HDLs, LDLs, triglycerides, all that stuff. Okay. Um, and so he was in a double blind study. So he did not know, never found out for sure what group he was in. Okay. But being that, you know, he's a human with a memory. <laughs> Okay. Before the study started, before he started taking the unmarked pills that we didn't know what they were, um, his, you know, numbers were, you know, X, Y, Z. Right. Um, and then he started taking the pills and he started having symptoms that are common with people who are taking huge doses of niacin. So you tend to get itchy, I guess. Um, and so he was like, yeah, I got totally itchy. Now, that could have all been in his brain, right? That could have been part of the placebo effect. He could have been like, yeah, one of the potential side effects of niacin is that you're supposed to get itchy. And just the fact that he was freaking out made him feel itchier. Like as soon as I said itchy, some of you got itchy, right? So some of you, as soon as I said the word itch, you're like, I got to go scratch this right now, right? Or if I say bug, some people get all like, huh, ah, bug. You get the creepy call, you get the heebie-jeebies, as I like to call them. Anyway. Okay. So, um, yeah. Okay. Uh, but then he also saw actual numbers, right? Cause they were telling him what his cholesterol was each time he got it checked at the doctor's office. And so he's fair. Like I said, he never did find it's a double blind study. He never did find out for sure, but he's, he's fairly certain that he was in the experimental group because he had the typical side effects and 
he, you know, exhibited the change in um, symptoms that you would expect um, in that particular study. So anyway, okay. Um, so that's a placebo effect and double blind studies, okay? Um, another thing that I said is kind of part of this idea of sample size, but not directly, is this idea of replication. So replication isn't the same as sample size. But it means essentially that if you were to do the study again, you would get similar results, okay? So really good example. And you guys are too young to remember this, but um, about 12 years ago, um, a Texas Tech University um, and Harvard did this research where they released some data that um, appeared to indicate that a particular drug called valproic acid um, might in fact be a cure for AIDS. What? And because people are so excited about this, um, you know, there was a lot of press coverage in early days, right? And everybody was super excited about it. Um, and good science means that somebody else then is gonna come in and be like, we're just gonna check that to make sure, right? We're just gonna make sure that that pattern occurs again. Because if it doesn't, if it doesn't occur again, then something probably went wrong. There was some, something strange happened. And in fact, the relationship that you're making probably is not true, okay? And so sure enough, right, additional studies after the fact found that really there wasn't as it turned out, there was not a relationship between valproic acid reducing HIV, right? So um, repetition is really important, okay? Um, all right. Um, all of, a lot of these things, particularly that involve humans, a lot of these details um, speak to bias, a concept called bias. So I'm sure you know what bias is. Bias is this idea that um, all of us, every single one of us, even if you don't think that you're biased, you are about some things. It's part of being human. It's part of the way that our brains work, okay? So an important thing to realize about bias is no one is without bias. All you can do is actively try to be aware and sort of confront your own biases, okay? Um, and if you wanna talk more about this, ask me about this. There's a really cool um, website um, that like does bias testing and you can actually find out how biased you are about particular things. And it's really, it's enlightening. It's really enlightening. So bias. So this is a little example from a different book that talks about bias. So um, one important part of science is um, publication of your research, of sharing the results of your research. And so what we're looking at here is we're looking at um, a, a study where they submitted papers, right? So research papers to um, reviewers. So to, uh, to scientific peers, to read those studies and decide whether or not they were high quality enough to be published. And so in one situation, the reviewers were able to determine the sex of the, of the author, right? So is it a male or a female? In the other one, they didn't include the author's names. You had no way of knowing if the author is, um, was male or female, okay? And what did they found? They found that there was a significant difference in, in the percentage of papers that were chosen for publication, right? When you couldn't tell that the authors were female, it was more likely for female authors to be published if you didn't know they were female, right? So a lot of people like to think that, you know, sexism has been handled, right? It's been, you know, that was a problem in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and it's, it's gone now right? It's not a problem, um, but it still is, right? Um, it still is an issue. And so, um, so that's, you know, just an interesting example of bias, okay? So all of these 
situations where we're talking about, you know, doing blind studies, when we talk about um, replication, when we talk about um, placebo effect and all of that, these things are all meant to reduce bias, okay? Um, and I'll, I'll kind of reiterate this point, right, that no human being is capable of being unbiased because it is within the fundamental nature of how our brains work. All we can do, the best we can do, is try to be aware of our bias and put tools in place to prevent it from us making decisions that are of a biased nature. Okay, so it's part of what makes us um, it part. It's part of what makes us human, right? And so, not to get too much into the like so sociology, anthropology, psychology weeds, because that's not this class, but. Um, one of the things that makes humans successful is that we tend to group people, right? We tend to group, and not just people, things, right? Like, you know, if you're a caveman and, you know, this person from the other, you know, tribe of cavemen, right, down, down in another place, if the first time you ran into them, you know, the, the guy beat the crap out of you, right? You're not going to trust anybody that's in his tribe. And it might just be that that one guy was crazy, but the way that you protect yourself is by being like, no, they're all bad, all of them, right? So to a certain extent, it's one of the ways that our brains protect us from danger. And that's why it exists. Like I said, it doesn't necessarily have any founding in reality, right? So what we need to do is just be aware of it and not make decisions based on bias. Yeah, but, um, but you know, it, it's, it's just fundamentally part of how our brains work. Okay. Sorry, I, that was a tangent. Um, you analyze results. So at the, at the end of your experiment, you have results. The way that you present your results matters, okay? Um, and so I'll probably, probably what I'll do is just have another little separate video about, actually, I kind of already talked about it, so I might as well. Sorry, this one's going to be long. Um, we do some sort of analysis of our results, right? And so we might use statistics for that. I don't want to get into the weeds too much about statistics because some of you guys are like, ew, that sounds like math, ew. Um, but the idea is that um, how do I know if my results are different or not, okay? Um, and while we, in the lab activities we do, we are not going to be doing sophisticated analysis because that's just not what we're doing. Okay. Um, it's important that as a consumer of information, you understand how to look at that. Okay. So here we have um, a graph. And so actually pause the video for a second after, after I finish explaining this. So think about what this graph means. So the title says lung cancer survival. The Y axis says survival time in months. The X axis is the age of the you know, participants in the study. And then the different colored bars. So blue is people who received cancer drugs. Red is people who received drugs and radiation. That key, by the way, if you're going to have a graph, keys are important if you have, you know, if you have different colors or whatnot. Okay. So pause for a second. Think about what this graph means and then unpause. Okay. And, you know, we'll come back to this. So what you'll notice is that comparing the under 70 crowd, right, comparing this crowd to this crowd, right, in both groups, the red bar is higher than the blue bar, right? So that means that in both groups, you see at least to an extent that drugs and radiation are produce longer survival time than drugs alone, okay? But then you see these really cool things here called error bars. Error bars tell you, okay, the whole bar gives us an idea of an average, but the error bars tell you how much variation there is away from that average. So were there people much above or much below that average? Okay, so what's significant about this image is that notice in this group, in our under 70 group, the error bars don't overlap. So what that means is that even the ones that didn't live as long as the others, it was still longer than 
the especially long lived ones in that group because they don't overlap. Okay. Whereas in the over 70 crowd, those error bars completely overlap. So it means that somewhere within this range, somewhere within this range, there's overlap. So even though the red bar seems higher than the blue bar, it's not significantly higher because within that sort of span of error, there, it, it's unlikely that there's a significant difference at all, okay? So that's an interpretation issue more than something that you're not gonna put error bars on any of the graphs that you guys make for this class, okay? Um, another thing I wanna talk about since we're talking about graphs is when is it appropriate to use a bar graph versus a line graph, okay? This also is very well labeled. It tells you like, you know, the different um, axes and all of that. So I'm not gonna go through it because we already kind of did in my previous example, but um, look at this in your book or in the PowerPoint, okay? So here's the deal with the, um, with how to know if you should do a bar graph or if you should do a line graph, okay? So a line graph is best when you're looking at a trend over time or something where the different things are continuous. Okay, so let's just real quick, let's sc scroll back to my, oh, whoa, I, swear, I went too far. <laughs> Slow down. Okay, so when I did my little weather, my amount of rainfall, right, I did a line graph. Why did I choose to do a line graph? Why didn't I use bars for each month? This is where you're supposed to be like, Yes, Sarah, as a matter of fact, I know why you used a line graph. Why did I use a line graph? Well, the reason that I use a line graph is time is a continuous concept, right? So January leads into February, which leads into March, and we're talking about weather that's all in the same area. So it's a continuous thing, okay? Now, what if instead of looking at weather in Southern California, over a period of time, over the course of a year. What if I looked at how much rain is there in January in a bunch of different parts of the world? So I looked at a bunch of different countries and I wanted to know how much rain there was in January in a bunch of different countries. Would that be a line graph? Probably not. Because what we're doing is we're not looking at a pattern over time, we're doing a comparison. So we're saying like, okay, SoCal compared to um, uh, the Ukraine, right? Or compared to Australia, right? Um, we're doing a comparison, which is typically when bar graphs are used, when you're comparing things that are unrelated as opposed to, right, um, looking at a pattern over time or looking at a relationship, okay? When in doubt, ask, okay? Because when you do graphs in lab stuff, it's important to have the right kind of graph, right? And so ask yourself the question of, am I looking at a pattern or a relationship or am I looking at a comparison? So line graphs are for patterns or, you know, like relationships or something that's happening over time. Bar graphs are used for comparing two different things, typically, two or more different things, okay? All right, so then the last step, of course, is to draw your conclusions. So you take those results, right, and you look at it and you, you know, kind of wrap it up. What was the, what are the results from this? So turns out in this particular study that individuals from all of the, group, all of the groups had the same percentage that developed a common cold. So whether or not they were taking a control or a placebo or nothing at all, the same percentage when exposed to the cold virus, got a cold. How long their symptoms lasted, on average, was the same for all the groups, right? Um, and so the conclusion of those two pieces of information is that echinacea had no effect on the duration or severity of the cold. So, um, yeah, right? Now, 
this idea of remember the scientific method is cool. So maybe you're like, you know, I don't know. I still think that this is worth continuing to investigate. So maybe, maybe just, you know, maybe our dose of echinacea was too small. So we need to change our study so that now it's a larger dose or maybe, you know, oh, well, if, you know, maybe it only works if people are on echinacea for a month before exposure, as opposed to just a week before exposure or, you know, whatever the case may be, you might do a different study, right? This whole cyclical nature of the scientific method. Um, this is one of the reasons why <laughs> with a lot of supplements, particularly, um, you know, herbal supplements, a lot of times they have a, a notice on them that says, you know, that there's no, you know, FDA requires them to say that, you know, there's no evidence that they work. Um, because in oftentimes they haven't been studied at all. Or if they have been studied, it, it turns out that they don't work the way that they say they're going to. These, these claims are not, you know, validated by the FDA because there's no evidence to suggest that they do work, okay? I don't want you to get the impression though, that this means that all herbal supplements or natural remedies are BS because that is absolutely not true, okay? There are many natural sources of chemicals that do all kinds of amazing things for us. So um, most chemotherapy, ultimately it's highly refined, but the drugs come from plants right? Essentially, they're herbal remedies, essentially, right? But they've been heavily studied and heavily tested, right? Um, and so the difference is, if it's something that we've tested and we know it works, we usually call it medicine, <laughs> or it's a drug. Whereas if it's something that hasn't been tested, it's like, oh, well, you can go get it at the, you know, the, the herbalist, right? You can go get it at GNC. But you know, it's not, you know, you're not going to get it at the pharmacy. Okay. Um, but there are exceptions to that too. So I've had uh, several situations where my doctor who is a mainstream, she's not a naturopath or, you know, um, super into like natural medicine has been like, yeah, there are studies that indicate actually that this particular herbal remedy turns out it is highly effective. But once again, it's based on studies. Okay. So that's where you want to that's what you want to use to make decisions about what kinds of treatments you want for, for health problems. Okay, so we're going to launch into pseudoscience in just a minute. I got to think for a second, though, about what I want to say. Oh, there is one other kind of wrap-up thing I want to say about the scientific method, and that is I actually have been fascinated to observe, as a scientist, to observe conversations in social media surrounding COVID, okay? So a lot of people who um, unfortunately don't have a lot of training in, you know, what science is um, or experience, right? Maybe they, you know, learned about it in school, but, you know, since then they haven't thought about it much, um, have expressed a lot of, um, in some cases, not in all cases, of course, have expressed a lot of distrust of science because quote we keep changing our mind okay but this is a really important thing to realize is that's how science works that's how we know science is working right so let's go back to this whole idea of the goal of science is to is always to punch holes in your ideas to be like we got we're trying to disprove everything right so i have an idea and we're going to try to disprove it right um and so it's when science particularly is first grappling <coughs> with something new there's a huge period of time where it's like, oh, we were wrong about this. Oh, we were wrong about that. Oh, we were wrong about this, right? And so masks are a great example of that, right? So in the beginning with COVID, the messaging that came out was, you know, the CDC was like, don't use masks because they didn't want people buying up all the N95, the, the super like high quality good masks that are required for medical professionals, 
right? They didn't want people buying those because we needed them for our medical professionals, right? We were limited in how many we had, unfortunately. Um, and so they didn't want people using those because we needed to save them for the people who needed it the most. And then, you know, a couple weeks later, it's like, actually, never mind. We want you to wear masks every time you go near anybody else. You have to wear a mask. So, you know, don't use the N95 ones, but use a cloth mask. And, you know, here's what that should look like. And da 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 da. Right. And a lot of people were like, well, so you guys don't know what you're talking about. You're just like, you know, throwing stuff out there. You're just making stuff up as you go. And we don't trust that. And that makes us angry. Um, the problem is that we are still in very much the early stages of learning about how COVID works, learning about how it's transmitted and all of that. So that's why, right, you see these changes in opinion, right? Because it takes time to study things and see how they have an effect. It takes time to collect data, right? So it took time to figure out, oh yeah, gatherings inside, those are the ways that people get it the most right? Um, I just read, I didn't read the full, full disclosure. I didn't read the, the published study, but I read a news article that was talking about how, you know, a lot of people have been like singing, singing is bad, right? <laughs> singing, singing spreads, spreads COVID, right? And the reason that that became a thing is because they saw that, right? They saw that people who attended choir practice, we were having these huge, like super spreading events where, you know, 50 people went to choir practice and, you know, a week later, 40 of them have COVID, right? Um, it turns out it's not so much the singing as it's the projecting. So speaking at a high volume, like a similar intensity that you would use while singing is just as dangerous, right? Um, which I find pretty interesting as a teacher because guess what? I project a lot, right? And so the idea that any kind of gathering of people where people are talking loudly, excitedly, singing, doing anything where they're <sighs> breathing out a lot is equally risky. But it takes time to collect data to know that that is a pattern that is emerging, okay? So um, yeah, so a lot of people feel really unsettled that science doesn't have all the answers, but science should not and would never claim to have all the answers when exposed to something new like this virus. And so we're learning new things every day. And so advice is changing all the time because of that, okay? And that's how science is supposed to work, all right? Okay, pseudoscience is exactly what it sounds like. So pseudo means false or fake. So pseudoscience is when something is trying to sound sciencey and it's really not. Um, so all the like crazy claims that you see on you know, products. I'm thinking like infomercials. Some of you guys probably have never watched an infomercial because you're too young, right? Um, but whenever you hear these things where they include numbers, like, oh, you could lose up to 10 pounds in 48 hours. Woo! Now notice there's an, a little asterisk. I don't know if you can see it, right? It's like, okay, that's what you might lose, but that's, mm, or it's never been tested or whatever. Okay. So What's the difference between science and pseudoscience? You will be doing an activity while you, where you investigate this this week. Okay, so there's a homework assignment this week while you're looking at pseudoscience. So here's the table that you want to refer back to when you're trying to decide if something is pseudoscience or not. So um, is it adhering to the established and well-recognized scientific method? So all the things we've been talking about in this lecture today, right? Um, or does it not really adhere to that? That's pseudoscience. Um, are the results repeatable, right? That idea of you need to repeat it, okay? So results cannot be duplicated or results that rely on, you know, this was the result for a single person or only based on opinion, not by something measurable, okay? Um, remember, the goal of science is to disprove, right? So you have to be able to say, if, if you can't say that something, if you can't measure something in order to say that it's not true, then you can't use science to measure it, okay? You can't use science to make that determination, okay? So if something is untestable, then it's, then it's pseudoscience, okay? Um, science is always reviewed, right? When people reject, external review or refuse to accept contradictory evidence, that's a sign that you're dealing with some pseudoscience right there, okay?
Lots of evidence, small amount of data. Okay. All right. Um, one other thing that I kind of forgot to mention that's actually really important is the type of data that you collect while doing the scientific method always has to be empirical. Um, here's the word empirical, um, and let's talk about what it means. So empirical data means that it's something that you can measure. Um, so something that you can see or something that like, like with the cookie measurement, right? How tall is my cookie? How fast did this happen? Right? So it's something that has, that can be measured in some way or another. That's what empirical data is, right? So science always uses empirical data. Pseudoscience may or may not <laughs> use empirical data. Okay. And then, so I, you know, there's, read these, <laughs> I'm not gonna go through it all again, right? And then there's a comparison of them side by side, um, right? And so just a couple of examples of pseudoscience. So fortune telling, not repeatable, right? If you go to three different fortune tellers, they're all gonna tell you something different, right? So, you know, it's, no, no, because you're getting different stuff every time, okay? Um, one of my favorite like lame TV show concepts is like ghost hunters, right? So like we have all these tools, we have all these gadgets, so we're, it's very scientific and, you know, our investigation and it's like, yeah, but th that's no, right? Scientific seeming, but useless, that's the key. Pseudoscientists use scientific seeming, but useless gadgetry. Um, another clue for pseudoscience is when you see people wearing lab coats. It's like, just because somebody's wearing a lab coat doesn't mean they're a scientist or a doctor, right? I could put a lab coat on my five-year-old. That doesn't mean she knows what she's talking about. She might though, because she's smart. Just saying. Anyway, okay. Um, pew, 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 pew. Oh my gosh. Ah, oh, hold on, keep. Sorry. That's what I get for getting overexcited. Where was I? Okay, so last bit. I'm sorry, this is long. I hope you paused and took a potty break somewhere in the middle. Um, anecdotal evidence. Anecdotal evidence is when somebody tells you their experience with something, okay? So a classic example of anecdotal evidence is, oh my gosh, you should totally use this conditioner. It made my hair so soft and shiny. It's like, okay, maybe it did have that effect for you, but has it been tested? Does it make everybody's hair shiny, right? Do we have a control group, experimental group? You know, what do we have? And so the reason that evidence is in quotes is that anecdotes, people sharing their personal stories, by definition, if it's a personal story about something, you can't have used the rigorous scientific method, right? Where you have a large sample size and there's a control group and an experimental group and you're only changing one variable and da da da, right? You can't do all of that if it's just an anecdote, a personal anecdote. So um, a really good example of anecdotal evidence gone wrong, right? Is the assumption and the belief that um, vaccines cause autism. Okay, so what's the deal with this? So I'm calling this section junk science because as much as scientists try to do a good job of reviewing each other's work, right? And when we find out that things, ah, it turns out we thought this, but it was wrong. We got to pull it, right? Um, sometimes we pull things too late and they have a big impact um, that is, is still causing problems, for example, okay? So let's talk about junk science. So science that has been done, but is not great. So where are the areas that people get themselves into trouble? One of them is with sample size, okay? So notice, right, sample size, okay? So the example that we're talking about here in 1998, a study was published in the journal called The Lancelet, which is a um, really renowned medical journal out of Britain, okay? Um, and so a, a, published, a, a study was published um, that claimed 
that the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine, the MMR vaccine, was associated with autism in children. Okay, um, this fundamentally was the beginning of people um, having a variety of different concerns around vaccination. Okay, now one of the reasons this is such a big deal is people feel really passionate about the health and welfare of their children, right? Because of course we would, of course we would, right? Um, and so this is really kind of like a hot button subject because of that. It's not like somebody said, oh, the, you know, such and such vaccine is going to make your dog have fleas. People would be like, okay. And then if they tracked it, they'd be like, okay, what, uh, whatever, right? But because this is something that people feel so strongly about, right? It, it, has, it has attracted a lot of attention. Okay, so we're going to look at some of the flaws in that study and why it was ultimately retracted um, and how studies since 1980, 1989, 1998 um, basically show that all of the conclusions that were made in that study, it turns out, were junk, junk science. Okay, so one of the biggest problems with that study is it only involved 12 patients. So we already talked about this idea of sample size, right? You need large samples to, to know if your results are significant. And when you only look at 12 kids, that's not a big enough number of kids to know if there's a pattern, right? Um, and so of those 12 kids that received the MMR, um, eight of them, Researchers claim the onset of autism symptoms associated with vaccine in eight of the patients. Okay, so eight out of 12. That sounds like a really high percentage, right? That sounds like, oh my God, that's like two thirds. That's huge. Okay, well, if it's only 12 kids, you don't know if that pattern is going to be true for the population at large. Okay, so since then, there have been many studies, one of which is the one that they're talking about in here, um, a nurse's health study that included almost 300,000 participants, right? 280,000. Okay. And they found that um, there is no um, relationship. So this is good science, right? There is no relationship between, oh, wait, hold on. I'm, I'm saying this wrong, okay? So they said that not no relationship. This is a, is a relationship. I'm getting this slide confused with the next one, sorry, uh, right? So they're making the statement that, okay, we looked at almost 300,000 people, right? And they're making a link. They're saying that there is a relationship between consumption of sweetened beverages, soda and whatnot, and development of high blood pressure, right? Well, in this case, they're looking at 300,000 people. So which one seems more like a pattern that's going to affect everybody? Looking at 300,000 participants or looking at 12? Okay. Right. Control groups. Okay. So once again, we're comparing our Keep losing my pen. We're comparing that MMR paper with that same um, sweetened beverages hypertension paper. Okay, so we're comparing those two results. Control groups, right? So here we have control group, right? We have those who consumed at least one sweetened beverage per day, those that had high consumption, right? Um, so one per day is high consumption, um, two to six per week, one to four per month, or less than once a month. And that was our negative control. So these are the ones who don't, re, you know, whatever. So control groups. Okay. In this study, it turns out all 12 of the kids were autistic. They were just saying that, oh, eight of these 12, they probably got it because of the vaccine, but every single participant had autism. There was no control group, right? You weren't comparing kids without autism and whether or not they received MMR, 
right? So not having a control group is a huge problem because remember, if you don't have a control group, you don't have anything to compare. It's crazy, okay? Reproducibility, right? So this idea of being able to replicate, right? Since that study in 1998, there have been hundreds of thousands of test subjects, right? Hundreds of thousands of data points across the US as well as other countries where they've tracked administration of the MMR vaccine and autism. And it turns out that autism rates are the same in children who receive that vaccine and children who do not receive the vaccine, right? So it appears autism occurs whether or not you get this vaccine in similar proportions, right? So you cannot reproduce that effect of 66% was due to, okay? Whereas this study of, you know, the relationship between the beverages and the hypertension absolutely has been consistent with other studies, right? So when they look at other data from other, you know, patients, medical records, right? They see the same pattern, okay? All right. Peer review is important. So another really important part of the scientific method, at least, you know, professional science, right? Is that other people, peers, ex other experts in the field, look at the research study that you've done and they decide if it's quality, right? They decide, does this meet all of the expectations of the scientific method? Is there an adequate control group? Or is, is the analysis appropriate, right? Are the claims that they're making, you know, does that line up with the evidence? Yeah. And so a lot of times studies don't get published, right? If they are not adequate. So paper is not worthy of publication. That, by the way, is what should have happened with this study. But the author knew somebody. There's all this like corruption stuff happening here um, that I, I'm not going to get into because I've already been talking long enough, but there's all this corruption about like why it got published when it should not have gotten published. It did get retracted eventually, but still. Okay. All right. So what's peer reviewed mean? Peer reviewed means that your peers have looked at your research and they have said, this is good science. They did a good job in following the scientific method. They did a good job in anal analyzing their data, right? It looks good. Okay. All right. One last thing. Sorry, I keep saying one last thing and then I keep talking more. One last thing is use of the terms hypothesis compared to theory. Okay. Um, in common day to day language, right? People use the word theory very differently than theory in science. So, Theory in science means something substantial. In common day-to-day -day language, when somebody says, I have a theory, probably what they mean is that they have a hypothesis, okay? So hypotheses, that's plural for hypothesis, by the way, right? Hypotheses, let me move my thing over here so I can see my own slide. You guys can't see that, whatever. But so when you have a hypo hypothesis, you don't expect that it's true necessarily. It's kind of like, I think that this thing is happening, but you don't know, okay? Um, hypotheses are very narrow in scope. So it's very much focused on one particular aspect of a question or one particular problem. Um, hypotheses are tested right away. Um, hypotheses, by definition, have to be falsif falsifiable. So they have to be something where it's possible that it's not true, okay? Um, and so they give a cool example of, um, of elephant ears. So um, a hypothesis, the large ears of an African ev elf elephant, <laughs> elephant or an evolutionary adaption that helps reduce body heat, right? So it could be falsifiable. It could be like, nope, that's not what, why elephant ears are large. It's for some other reason, right? So it's falsifiable, okay? This differs from a theory in that, oh, my poor computer is hot, it's tired. It doesn't want to go. Can I go? 
there we go um theories are well substantiated and have never been shown to be false so what does well substantiated mean it means that there is an abundance in some cases incredible amounts of very diverse evidence none of which has been shown ever to be false okay um notice that the second point here it says broad in scope so you don't talk about in science anyway you don't talk about how you have a theory about one specific small thing theories are like big picture patterns in science so the theory of evolution or cell theory or for that matter gravity gravity is a theory right how gravity functions um the existence of gravity is a theory okay um so theory in science means that something is very well substantiated has never been never been shown to be false it's very broad in scope supported by a large body of evidence still needs to be falsifiable right it could be refuted by contradictory evidence it could happen but it hasn't yet yet it hasn't thus far okay um right so here's an example of a theory physical adaptations evolve over many generations due to the reproductive success of individuals with heritable traits that are best suited to the local environment so that's that's natural selection <laughs> okay um right and so oh look at all those little elephants of various types right so there's a modern elephant and a mammoth and a bunch of ancient elephant relatives look at how their ears have changed over time that's interesting and their overall body size has changed over time for that matter look at how their tusks have changed over time that's kind of cool looks like some of the ancient guys used to have like bottom tusks too hmm. Hmm. anyway okay so that's the difference between um hypothesis and theory okay um the last thing the very last thing to sort of drive home is this idea that when science is in reality um all of these different stages in science are all kind of leading back and forth into each other right so exploration can lead to testing and vice versa right outcomes can lead to more exploration and vice versa right so you can yeah so like all it doesn't always go in that perfect order okay and a lot of times there's a lot of back and forth and flow okay all right seriously i need i need to stop talking now because I'm tired and it's hot and my computer needs a needs a break. Okay. So do you guys. Okay. All right. So that's it for today. Okay. We are going to stop this. Well, that's it for this week, right? Because I'm only doing one lecture a week. I should do shorter lectures. I'm sorry. Pause them when you get bored. Fast forward through the yucky parts. Okay. Sorry. Um, see you guys in Zoom. Bye.